Hi hey YouTube, this is Patrick. This is my review of Game of Thrones Season 2, Episode 7, A Man Without Honor. Um, this one was actually a little weird uh, for me, considering that um, I thought that by Episode 5 we were going to be you know, at a much faster pace for the rest of the season. We had been. Um, so I went into the episode kind of expecting um, just a faster pace episode, basically. Um, and uh, what we got was pretty much the opposite. We got a much, much slower paced episode than I thought we were going to get. Um, and on the first watch of it last night, I was a little restless like halfway through because it just wasn't what I expect. And usually if you're expecting something to be, you know, fast paced and the plot to really, you know, like move. And then when that doesn't happen, it's usually, you know, it's usually a negative reaction to it. Um, the... Uh, I mean, basically, all the, most of the scenes in the episode were one-on-one um, -on -one character scenes, which the, the two head writers of the show, uh, David Benioff and uh, Dan Weiss, love one-on-one -on -one scenes. If you go back to the first season, they absolutely love just having two people in a room just talking. Um, and that's fine, because they're very good at writing those, those, uh, those things. But, uh, again, it just wasn't what I expected. Uh, not to mention, I thought the first half of the episode felt really, really, like, um, poorly, like, edited, or just, they just didn't transition <clears throat> anywhere near as well as they normally do. I felt like we were jumping around way too much, and yet we were moving slow, so it, it was just very, you know, if we were jumping around a, a lot, and, you know, crazy things were happening everywhere, then I would, then it's a little different, but, um, it just it felt very, uh, discombobulated for at least the first half hour, but when I rewatched the episode, and when I thought about it again today, I enjoyed it a lot more than, um, than I did on the first watch. Um, and I think it's really probably one of the better episodes, at least the second half of the episode is really one of the best half hours they've had uh, this season. Um, just when I think about it more, it just really was well done. Um, you know, basically this was the last breather before, you know, shit hits the fan. Um, which is coming, because we know they mentioned Stannis is like four days away from King's Landing. Um, and that that's gonna be episode nine, so things are really gonna like ratchet up next week, and then forget about it, the last two. So um, it's actually smart. It's a smart move to take a little breather here um, when you go on this season on a rewatch. I think, or at least I hope it's gonna be. But anyway, um, as far as Stannis does go, I'm a little worried that maybe it's almost too little too late on like you know. I'm obviously he'll be next week to set up that he's gonna you know attack, but. You know, did we get too little of them? Um, was it not set up well enough? We'll find out next week, I guess, on that. I'm a little worried about that. I hope it doesn't feel too rushed next week, but we'll find out. Um, the Arya and Tywin scene, it's the third one in a row. Another great scene. You know, they have great chemistry. Um, the Mountain, the new guy that plays the Mountain has lines. I'm still not really convinced by him, but, uh, you know, whatever. I like how the two characters, Arya and Tywin, are just feeling each other out. I liked all their references, their exposition, um, just history, the re you know, each one, Tywin saying she reminds him of his daughter, and just both kind of just playing games with each other. It was, it was a lot of fun, but I couldn't kind of help think that if they, you know, gone to the well too many times with these two characters, like the third week in a row of having a scene like this, should they have done something different? Um... We'll see how it goes forward. I've loved these scenes, but it almost felt like it was like this could have been one where they could have really moved plot ahead for this one part here. Uh, and we got the guys being, you know, hanged outside in Harren Hall. Great CGI shot, by the way, of Harren Hall in the um, on this spot. But I don't know. It just felt like maybe we should have gotten more plot on this section of it. Instead, we got a great one-on-one -on -one scene. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not gonna be too negative on it because I enjoyed it. So it's just kind of. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Johnny Gret was uh, very, very funny. It was the lighter part of the episode. Um, I mean, it makes John look like such an idiot, uh, which is very funny. And you kind of forget that John, like Rob and Sansa and Arya and Bran and you know Danny, are all basically learning as they go here. They're all very, very young. Uh, they're younger in the books. They're you know about four or so years younger in the books. So it, you know. But still, you know, these people are haven't don't know this world really that well yet, uh, and they're finding out and making mistakes. Um, also, I like the other day that John 
everyone kind of get, gets a taste of everyone else's, you know, world here and what other people's, like, views are and how strange everyone is to everyone else. And, um, they do that a lot also. Um, probably no more strange than what the Wildlings think of, like, everyone else, but, uh, especially the Night's Watch and all their, their vows that they have to take. Um, but anyway, uh, the whole thing with the wall was a lot of fun, and obviously that's gonna pick up a little bit, because now John's been captured, or we'll just get more, you know, uh, more crazy Wildlings, which would be good. Um, Danny... Yeah, Karth isn't as exciting as it could be. Um, or I should just say, it be, it just feels a little... Whenever we go to Karth, I'm thinking, like, alright, let's, you know, see what they have. I never think, like, alright, nice, you know, we're here. Um, I like that she kind of complained to Zaro about, like, you know, I don't want to hear about where you're from again, because I was already tired of that. Like, I'm sure p people were tired of Danny yelling about her, you know, fire and blood shit. Um, the, uh, the Jorah Danny scene was the real, like, one on one scene that we had here. Uh, it was very nice and awkward. Um, but, um, you know, and the talk about trust again, and, uh, you just can't trust anyone, what you find out, what she finds out later on. You know, she's sort of having, like, a growing, she's throwing, like, half a tantrum, which she's upset, and then, but she's also, you know, she has reason for how pissed off she really must be. I mean, everyone, even, like, Jorah, Jorah her, like, her best, you know, advisor, just, like, wants her, and she's like, you gotta be shitting me with this. Um, but, you know, it's just, um, you can understand where she's coming from with that. Uh, the Lady Gaga woman, Quaith, I think her name is, she seems kind of unnecessary. You know, alright, she's odd, she's wearing a mask, she's, you know, tattooing some guy. We got a little, like, you know, mythology and stuff in there. Didn't really feel needed, because... It's not like Jorah would have been able to help from what happened at the end of the episode anyway. We saw what happened when he did intervene. Nothing. The guy just, you know, pulled a Obi-Wan Kenobi and just fucking uh, dropped his robes. But, uh, yeah, so I don't really know. Unless they're going to do more with her, I'm not really sure what the hell the point of that was. Um, we'll find out, I guess. I, get, I'm, I think she's supposed to be from the same area Melisandre's from. Maybe. Don't, don't, like, quote me on that. I'm not sure. So maybe that's supposed to be some connection there. Uh, with how much knowledge both of them have on things, but whatever. Um, killing the 13 wasn't really a big holy shit moment. It was kind of like, oh, okay. Um, but I will say that I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the House of the Undying because they keep on mentioning it, and it's obviously, obviously they're building up to it. And usually you're not going to build up to something like this unless you're going to pay it off. Um, much like they're doing with, you know... The, the battle at King's Landing, that's gonna pay off, so I'm, I, I expect this to pay off, too. Um, and, uh, Danny's situation does feel more desperate, which is nice, you know, there needs to be a little urgency there on her side, because that stuff can get really, really just dull really, really fast, um, because she's so far removed from everyone else, so there's a sense of urgency, which is good. Moving on to King's Landing, which was just fantastic this week, um, Sansa was pretty much shut down by the Hound and continued her learning curve on the world not being a kind place. You know, tries to thank him and he just, like, throws it back at her. You know, just just gets at least the courage to ask him, why are you so angry? Or maybe she feels she can ask him because he just saved her anyway. Um, and then he threw that back in her face with about what's going to happen when it's just you and Joffrey and I'm the one in the middle. Then we get her, you know, uh, having her first, her, her flowering, which, by the way, I gotta say that, um, not that it was fun watching, you know, her almost get raped again, but I'm glad that they didn't just blow that over. I mean, she's like a 13-year-old girl. She should be, you know, a little traumatized by what happened. So, I'm, it, it's, it's cool that that was, like, her, I mean, that's something that they really could emphasize with. That's really, like, an awful thing to happen, um... And it's cool they didn't just, like, brush it under the rug and just like, yeah, that happened last week, she's fine. You know, she's not fine. She shouldn't be. Um, and Sophie Turner was great in her scene where she woke up and, you know, she was so frantic. Um, looks like she can cry on cue. Because uh, when Shay came back up and found her. 
Um, you know, she was sitting there with the hound, so that's good. That's going to be helpful. Uh, by the way, Shay, I don't know what Shay's doing, uh, chasing the girl down, which was nice, good intentions, but then she just lets her go. Um, should have chucked her down the steps, at least, if anything. Uh, I don't know what that would have done. I guess she could. I guess she couldn't have done that, but you know, just seems useless to let her go. Um, the Sansa's. Yes, I have notes. Sansa's best scene was with Cersei. Um, Cersei's two scenes were great this week. The it was nice that Cersei is not just oblivious to everything going on. She understands that Joffrey is just a monster. And she was able to connect with Sansa on her past. I love that she was able to talk about Robert, but basically know in her heart that Robert is nowhere near as bad as like Joffrey was, and he she knows what Sansa's gonna have to go through. Um, and it's a very appropriate Mother's Day message, which I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure probably wasn't intended. They didn't know this was gonna air on Mother's Day. Um, with Cersei just saying, "Just love your children. That's it." Um, and Sansa's still kind of playing the game, saying, oh, but I do love Joffrey. And Cersei knows she's bullshitting. But even Sansa kind of, like, takes that away a little bit and just, you know, says, well, shouldn't I love the king? She's really, actually, genuinely begins to ask her questions. Um, and it was a nice connection scene. And obviously, Cersei's not going to be, you know, she's not just doing it just to be kind to Sansa. She's doing it to help, to, you know, to make sure Sansa doesn't stab Joffrey in the throat or doesn't, or just whatever, just doesn't, you know try to figure a way out. She's just basically telling her how you're going to have to deal with it. Um, it's just a great scene. And her scene with Tyrion, um, I, I felt horrible. I, felt, um, I, feel, I guess I didn't feel horrible for Cersei, but the two of them being able to coexist in a moment um, was really, really nice, and I almost really hope, wish that they could somehow just coexist. Because it would be so, you know... Cersei was just a little more kinder all the time, and Tyrion, and they were just able to get along, they would really be able to, you know, be very strong about how they would go about things, but instead it's just a mess. And, um... I love Dinklage not knowing how to comfort her. That was simultaneously funny and very, very sad, because I kind of wanted to see him, you know, just reach out his hand or, or give her a hug or something, but it's it was very funny. Um... The Robin Talisa thing, we all know where that's going. Um, they're just making it a little more, you know, obvious, I think, week by week. Um, yeah, so. Uh, best scenes this week were with uh, Jamie, who we haven't seen since episode one. Um, Nicholas Custer Waldo, who plays Jamie, said the, his favorite scene he's ever done in his career was in this episode, and it was that scene with his cousin. Um,. I wasn't surprised by the outcome of the scene, but it was a great scene because the beginning of it, you think we're just kind of catching up with Jamie because we haven't seen him in a while. And the scene just slowly turns into something that you're kind of interested in, you know, hearing about the history because it was so well written or hearing about what happened that day. And then the scene continues to turn again. It, like, it made like three turns as it went. Um, and it really was just a brilliant scene. Brilliant scene. Um... Catelyn, uh, the scene with Catelyn that Jamie had, uh, first the thing with Carsuck, you know that's gonna screw everything up. Um, but I like how, you know, fierce she was able to be with that guy and basically shut him down and shut Jamie down, just shut everybody down. It was just, it was, that was nice to see. And then, um, her scene with Jamie was basically the sequel to the season finale, the season one finale scene. Um, Except both characters were just much more aggravated this time around. Um, I love how Jamie turned everything on her, um, and she really didn't have an answer for him. Um, it's just, it's kind of nice to see that. Um, and you don't quite root for Jamie in the scene, but, you know, you know, Catelyn hating Jon Snow is kind of shitty, so when, you, when he makes his point, you're almost completely behind him because you, I think you, at least I obviously agree with it, so yeah, just uh, just great scene. Good cliffhanger too with her taking the sword out, you know, what is she gonna do? Um, also we got the episode title, which is A Man Without Honor which will transition to Mr. Mr. Greyjoy up in Winterfell doing a bang-up job um, 
Yeah, he basically has no honor. He's completely in over his head, and he let two children die. Hopefully they didn't burn alive. Hopefully they just burned them after they killed them. Um, as far as whether or not it was Bran or Rickon, you know, you'll have to tune in. Um, it was a great, 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 great cliffhanger, and I loved Greyjoy's face at the end of the episode because at the beginning he's talking to Lou and he says, oh, everything's a game. When he sees those two dead, charred kids at the end, you know, his face is just like, this isn't, you know, fun. This is serious stuff, and he's not ready for it. And you just, you know that it's just going to turn so bad for him. Uh, which he deserves now. Uh, but it might not be as satisfactory um, if you watch it from beginning to end, as far as the way this season is going. Um, also, great music to end the episode. The Greyjoy theme, and it was just like pounding on the soundtrack to really like emphasize what just happened at the end. Uh, at least the shock value of it, so it was great. Um, Alright, I'm switching to the spoiler section now for the book readers. Shit, this is 16 minutes already. I'm going to try to breeze through this. I probably won't be able to. So if you, don't, if you haven't read the books, don't listen. Shut this off. Alright, here we go. Um, Stannis... Uh, I don't remember if there's Davos chapters between what we've seen so far and when we get to Blackwater, so I don't know if they're really cutting anything out there or or what. Uh, but Stannis will be back next week. Um, I don't think they're cutting anything out. I don't really remember. Um, the Arya and Tyrion and Arya and Tywin stuff, I kind of wish we'd have got more with, with Jock, uh, Jock and Hagar, where she was trying to really decide if she was going to name Tywin as the third name. Obviously, next week she's going to just name, you know, Jack and Hagar as the third name. Um, but I almost feel we haven't gotten to the point where she would do that yet. Like, I don't, maybe that should have been set up a little bit this week. Uh, we'll see how it plays out next week. Excuse me, we'll see how it plays out next week. Uh, that is happening next week, if you look at the episode synopsis, so. I thought that might be. See, I thought that might feel a little too rushed with the idea that they made they did too many Arya Tywin scenes, as good as they are. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, oh, it was nice to hear the Brotherhood without banners again. Obviously, that's coming in Season 3, so I'm glad they were mentioning it, mentioning, mentioning it here. They've done that before, but I'm glad they're keeping it in. Um, smart of them. Uh, as far as John goes... I had the little mini rant last week that, you know, it's going to end the same way with him killing Halfhand, and it's going to. Uh, but I was kind of hoping that Halfhand would recapture them this week. Um, instead, I'm kind of weary on how John's going to get back to him. He's going to, but I, almost, I guess they're going to have to have the Wildlings capture him too, which people are going to complain about, but then not completely forget that that's pretty much what happens in the book at the end. John and him have to fight because they are captured, so... Um, uh, I'm just trying to think if there's something else. Oh, hearing you know nothing, Jon Snow was very, very nice to hear. He was waiting for it last week. She delivered it, delivered it perfectly. I love the way she emphasis, emphasis, um, puts the emphasis on his name. Uh, I love the way he says she says his name, too. So I might even find it less annoying than I did in the book. I found it annoying eventually until the last time she says it. Then it kind of makes all the other previous times awful. Like everything else in those books, just everything hurts. Um, Danny, the Karth, the Karth stuff in, in on the show is better than the Karth stuff in the book because in the Karth stuff in the book, she's doing nothing but sitting on her ass. So um, we know Zaro's an asshole by book five, where he kind of declares war, or Karth does. Now he'll just be the king that declares war, pretty much. Um, so they're moving up his asshole status to you know Clash of Kings here. I don't remember what he did and if he did something that all... I think she just turned him down in the second book and that was kind of it. Um, but now we kind of see him as a little bit of a force to be reckoned with here. Um, I have no idea what's going I don't remember anything about Quaith in the book. I know she talks to Danny once, but I, I couldn't tell you what happened. That's how much I paid attention to that, to Danny's stuff in the second book. Except for the house and dying. Which is going to be in the finale. That means we're not getting any white beard or Barristan this season, so... But I like that the House of the Undying is going to be, like, its own thing um, in the last episode. It's going to come after the whole Blackwater stuff, so I'm sure it's going to be a pretty prominent, you know, thing, especially with setting up stuff for next season. 
Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. And the fact that they're doing all this weird shit before we get there, I'm really expecting some batshit crazy stuff now. I didn't think we were going to get that, but I expect it now. Um, 13, all dead, who cares? Um, Sansa, I like that they use the... Um, the yay Rangers scored watching the Rangers Devils game that they uh, use Sansa's when she almost got raped as the substitute dream before she um, had her her period. Um, yeah, the Sansan. So that that was a good um, like condensing of that. The Sansan scene we got. I think well some of it was like verbatim from the book, but I thought was that supposed to be his like night speech that he just didn't give her? Or was that later on? I don't really remember. Um, Cersei counseling is she's a little bit kinder in the book she counsels her and is a little you know kind of bit of a bitch but she does counsel her um, I liked it here more just because I don't know I like the um, I guess I like kinder people so I don't know it's just me um, the Tyrion Cersei stuff I know Cersei hugs him in the book when I think she finds out that Renly's dead she gives him like a huge hug and Tyrion is like so shocked and almost enjoys it that it's a little sad. That's what that scene reminded me of this week. It's a completely different scenario, but um, that's what it reminded me of. So I'm glad, at least in my head, I got some version of that part from the book that I liked. Um, but uh, it's so extra painful, though, because you know she's going to just screw with him next week um, that you saw from the preview with Shay or whatever she's going to do. So it's, it sucks. Uh, Rob and uh, Talisa or Jane or whatever... The scene felt like Bolton was going to say something to him and he, he got... It was like a deleted scene where he got cut. Um, I do like that Bolton's hanging around because Bolton's one of his downfalls. So, um... Yeah. Um, I don't know what drama they can really add to the Rob Talisa stuff that they're doing right now. They're doing pretty much probably the best they can with it. Um... Awesome for the Car Stark stuff that's in. Get to see Rob, you know, take his head off uh, next week. Or somebody's head off next week, so that'll be good. Um, on top of finding out what happened with Brandon Ricken at Winterfell, which I guess we're going to get. Um, the Catelyn scene, it was basically the second half of the scene with the end of the Clash of Kings. Um, since we got some of it last season, we got like the second part of it this year. Or, or some semblance of it. The whole vow speech, um, which I loved. I'm glad they kept that in. Uh, that was Jamie's escape attempt, which you heard about in the book. Obviously not for the same reasons and didn't happen the same way, but I figured they were going to put that in in some way. Uh, I'm glad they did. I thought they would put it in earlier. I'm, I can't believe we, we took six, six episodes to see Jamie again. Um, but, yeah. Uh, the first Brienne interaction was hilarious and automatically looking forward to it uh, even more now uh, than I was before. Um... Okay, pretty much at the end here. Theon... I guess they're not hiding in the crypts, everybody. Or do they double back and go hide in the crypts? Is that what they're gonna do? Or... I don't... I don't know. They're just automatically going into the woods. Um... And Theon didn't char... They didn't char the bodies in the book. It's just their heads dipped in tar. This was much more unsettling. Uh... So props to them. Again, I'm being worse, worse people. Than Martin sometimes. Um... I like that Hodor said Hodor like three times. They haven't they haven't done that yet where he you know they really really you know made a big joke out of it which was funny. Um, Rickon had you know multiple lines, so it's a bigger surprise for me than when all the the fucking thirteen got their throats slit. Um, the end of the episode worked for people that hasn't read the book. I've heard some people where they, they look at it and they go, that can't be Brandon Rickon. I'm pretty sure it's those two orphan kids. They picked up on it. But some people, they really might believe it. And other people, they're really not sure. They're kind of like, you know, you kill off Ned, you might do this too, which is what you kind of feel when you're reading the book. So so props to them on getting that done. All right, that's it for this. Um, very strong episode that I didn't, that grew on me. In, in 24 hours. I thought I felt the same way about episode 5, uh, but that one ended up being my least favorite of uh, this season. Episode 7 I liked very, very, very much. Um, and I am looking forward to things picking up pace next week just completely. Um, so next week should be nuts. Alan Taylor is back to directing, um, which is awesome. So, uh, 
yeah, that's it. All right, guys. Later.